Africa. And it, it is a great pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Spoonley, uh, one of New Zealand's leading academics uh, and a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. Um, his knowledge of immigration, racism and race relations, white supremacist and hate speech, as well as employment, education, regional development and, and um, Oakland diversity has frequently been sought by news media around the world over the past 40 years. He joined the <clears throat> Massey University staff in 1979 and was until becoming pro vice chancellor in October 2013. He was the college research director and Auckland regional director. Uh, <clears throat> sorts by news media now, facing demographic around the disruption world in the past 2020. And, and he is a, a regular commentator in the news media. In 2010, he was a Fulbright senior scholar at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. And in 2013, a senior visiting fellow at the Max Planck Institute of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Göttingen. He was awarded the Royal Society of New Zealand Science and Technology Medal in 2009 in recognition of his academic scholarship, um, leadership and public contribution to cultural understanding. And in 2011, his contribution to sociology was acknowledged with the Sociological Association of Iteroa New Zealand Scholarship for exceptional service uh, to New Zealand sociology. In 2013, he was given the title of Distinguished Professor, Massey University's highest academic title. Professor Spoonley, it is an honor to have you here uh, with us tonight, today, and um, the floor is yours. Um, hola, and uh, Elena, that makes me, <laughs> that introduction makes me somewhat embarrassed, um, but it's a delight to be here and, and to contribute. I'm, um, so a warm welcome to my colleagues, both at uh, UNAM and in Mexico and to, and to mine at Massey University. And I'm just going to bring my, if I could just provide a bit of a backstory and then come to the question of uh, COVID and mobility and migration in the 21st century. Uh, just to add to what Anna Elena has said, I'm the co-director of Metropolis, which is the major international network on migration and um, settlement. And what we've been um, doing is trying to work out what's going to happen uh, from this time, 2021 forward. Can I just provide a couple of background um, elements of New Zealand through here? Uh, New Zealand is a settler society. It's one of the five immigrant receiving societies. So immigration was always seen as part of the um, development of a, a new nation state. And as you can see there, uh, we went from being a very British colony. And when I say very British, I mean that literally 98% of all our migrants came from Britain and, and Ireland. We, our, 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 um, our migrants were very, not very diverse at all. And then there was a transition period, the 60s and 80s. And since the 80s, we've been governed by neoliberal um, policies in terms of migration. I'll come back to that a little bit more. The second complicating factor is that um, we have a very large indigenous population who are here prior to colonization. And as you can see, about 15% of our population self-identify. I should explain that in New Zealand, uh, you self-identify in terms of your ethnicity. It is not something that is imposed on you. You can multiple claim, so you can claim as many identities as are appropriate. And it means that our Statistics always add up to more than 100%, which is always an interesting uh, challenge for a statistician. In Orangatirata is the idea that Māori have sovereignty as well as the state. And so we've described very much as a bicultural state with a very strong Māori presence in terms of culture and language. And the Treaty of Waitangi, which was signed in 1840 between the new colonisers and the indigenous Māori, is something that has become legally and politically much more important. So when we talk about diversity, that's always needs to be borne in mind. Uh, our first wave of non-British migrants came in the 60s and 80s from the Pacific. And then in 1986-87, a reforming Labour government uh, made changes which introduced the very large flows of Asian migration to New Zealand. And you can see the three key countries there, China, India, and the Philippines. 
Now, just to explain the immigration policies that currently exist, they're very much what I would call a pick and choose system. So 60% of the migrants who are, are, are approved to come to New Zealand come under the um, skilled migrant category. They need to have skills that are wanted and that New Zealand employers are, are prepared to um, sponsor them for. There are certainly a large number of temporary labour migration um, uh, migrants, I beg your pardon, and um, very many of them have come from um, Central and South America. I I'm currently on holiday in the South Island, and um, in, in our restaurant yesterday, the Argentinian, the, the waiter was an Argentinian who served me, and the short order cook was Mexican, uh, both on temporary permits in New Zealand. New Zealand has a very soft citizenship regime. Once you're given permanent residence in New Zealand, you can do everything that I can do as a New Zealand citizen, and you can vote. So we don't require you to become a citizen of the country in order to have uh, the rights that other people who are citizens have. You are given those rights. The numbers now, um, particularly in the last decade, the numbers arriving in New Zealand who are permanent migrants and who come here and contribute to the net gain. So there's always people who leave, but the people who arrive. Uh, if you calculate it as against the uh, population of the country, then we have the highest inward net migration gain of any country in the OECD. And I've taken the 12 months to November 2020. Now, what you will immediately notice is we went into lockdown and in March 2020. But in that year, we had a gain of uh, 79,000 migrants uh, with 150,000 arrivals and 74,000 departures. That really means that, uh, that our net gain is somewhere between 1.5 and 2% of our total population per year, which is very, very high compared to most other countries. And here's the Here's what the graph looks like. It's complicated. I'm not going to spend much time on it. What you'll notice is the blue line of the arrivals, and they've spiked in the last two decades. So we're getting a lot of people arriving and not too many living, uh, leaving, <laughs> living, leaving. Um, and, and I'm not sure whether it's um, apparent to all of you, but you can see that the net gain between 2013 and 20 is quite extraordinary. Um, uh, over 400,000 people. And then if you look at the net gain per 1,000 people in 2019, so prior to lockdown, New Zealand had a net gain of 11.4 migrants. Australia was 6.2, the UK 2.4, USA 3.8. You can see that New Zealand per head of population has uh, three times more migrants than the USA, um, but we're a very small country. Um, let me... Let me turn now to some of the impacts of that migration. This is a map that we've done recently, which looks at the percentage of people in Auckland, so the mappers of Auckland, who are of Chinese identity. So we can do them in two, we can look at them in two ways. One is their birthplace, one is their identity, their ethnic identity. And as you can see here, the very ra red parts, uh, suburbs, uh, where at least 20% of the population are Chinese. Um, some suburbs have no Chinese whatsoever. But you can see from the, um, the three boxes that um, indicate 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and 20% 20 um, of the population in that suburb is Chinese. You can see the density and the numbers of Chinese that are, uh, that are now resident in Auckland. Um, about a third of all Auckland's residents, Auckland has a population of 1.5 million. About a third of those residents are Asian, so from India, China, the Philippines, and other countries. And that's produced some very significant changes to how we live and consume in New Zealand. Um, you might or might not be aware that uh, one of our few claims to fame is that we have a very good um, rugby uh, team, the All Blacks, and rugby is our national sport. Uh, but these new immigrants are not playing rugby. And so there is a significant decline, particularly at school age, of people playing rugby. So it's it's changing our political spaces and our public spaces 
It's providing us with ethno burbs, which are those suburbs which see large proportions of their suburb um, occupied by immigrants, and particularly immigrants of a particular ethnic group. And then ethnic precincts are those suburbs, those um, um, uh, retail areas which have large numbers of co-ethnic people all located in one in one area. And then we're also, of course, seeing the generational influences uh, in terms of the mig- uh, children of the migrants who've been born here. When I was at the University of California, Berkeley, um, uh, which was mentioned before, I looked at second generation Latino identities in, in California, and it was fascinating. You know, the, 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 the continuation of Spanish into the second and third generation, the way in which some uh, elements of identity and culture were discarded and then some retained. So we're doing that the same here. Auckland, uh, a few years ago, was named the fourth most diverse city in the world in terms of the numbers of people who are from minority ethnic and religious communities and the numbers who are immigrants. So it's just behind Toronto. It's ahead of any Australian city. And it's certainly ahead of some of the big cosmopolitan cities like London or Los Angeles. So I'm working with Steve Vertevecht, who's the director of the Max Planck uh, Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity. And we're looking at this new type of diversity that's emerged in cities. We're looking at um, Vancouver, Sydney, Toronto, Johannesburg, New York. And um, of course, I'm leading the work on, on, on Auckland. And as you can see there, what we do see um, the finest city is super diverse, is 25% or more. Auckland, uh, at least 40% of the Auckland population are immigrants. That is that they are born overseas. And so this is what we're doing. And it's on the Max Planck website. Um, we're looking at Canada, Australia, New Zealand in this particular thing, a particular study, and we've been looking at it for some time. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's 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 an interesting way of visualizing the diversity and the implications of immigrants. And it gets rather complicated. And I've just drawn up. I've just shown you one of our diagrams, which on the left shows you the ethnic group, and then on the right it shows you their identity. And what you can do is you can hover on on one of these groups, um, uh, you know, other European, and you'll find the uh, religious identity that they have. Um, now let me come to my last piece to 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 wind up. Uh, Clearly, um, the arrival of COVID has disrupted mobility and migration around the world. And one of the questions is, or two questions that we've got that we're working on at the moment is, uh, when will mobility uh, resume and what will it look like? And our thought is that it's not going to look like mobility and migration pre-2020. In the case of New Zealand, uh, this is our... Um, arrivals and departures, the graph for our arrivals and departures, the uh, arrivals being the, the, the top and line and the departures being the bottom. And as you can see in 2020, it just zeroed out. It ended, really. Um, so some of the things we're looking at locally and some of the things that we're looking at internationally is how do we have a system which copes with COVID-19? Now, there, there are some things, and I just want to signal these because you might have um, different ideas, but the first is, is vaccination. Vaccinations are being rolled out, but they're being rolled out at various speeds and with various coverage. So if I'm going to go to a country which has a very high infection rate, let's say the USA, at which point, even if I've uh, I'm been vaccinated, at which point am I going to be, is it going to be safe to me for me to go to the USA? when a significant proportion of the population is still not vaccinated. So is vaccination simply for those who are going to travel, but then what happens when they get there? We're going to have to develop travel protocols. Um, When I first started traveling in the 1970s internationally, we used to carry a card which told the arrival officials whether we'd had typhoid uh, and and, and vaccinations for typhoid, um, rabies, you know, various things. So. What is that going to look like? Um, one of them is going to be in, oh, and, and, and alongside travel protocols, of course, uh, if you travel at the moment, and none of us are covered in terms of travel insurance for COVID. 
So one of the big issues is if you catch COVID in another country, who pays for that? Uh, there's the in-country management of, of COVID-19, and I don't need to stress the point that there's been a huge variety of um, ways of managing or mismanaging that. And then, of course, we're starting to get to the point where in a country like New Zealand, like many other countries, um, the fact that we're not getting migrants is we've got huge labour and skill shortages. And there's always the question of politicising um, vaccination. Um, well, everything from, from uh, wearing masks all the way through. So what we've been doing is looking at social cohesion in a post-COVID world. Migration is part of that. You can see there's a, a paper that we did quite recently. Um, social cohesion in New Zealand has been high, uh, but then what happens when we begin to open up our borders? Because we have closed borders at the moment. So here are my last two slides. Um, I anticipate that there will be minimal migration. So remember I described the, the period between uh, 2010 and 2020 is being very high in New Zealand in a pro rata sense having the highest rate in the OECD. Um, that rate will be minimal because our Prime Minister is simply not prepared to risk the country by opening up the borders and so there'll be slower population growth. The Europeans that I'm working with suggest that um, migration and mobility will not resume until about 2023-2024 so the assumption that somehow, you know, January 2021 or March 2021, and then we're going to go back to some sort of normality, um, that's not there, partly because uh, if you think about the infrastructure, um, the number of planes and all the infrastructure that's built around international travel has been severely disrupted. And it looks as though two-thirds of the airlines that operated around the world, both locally and nationally, uh, prior to COVID will not exist at the end of COVID. In New Zealand, uh, we will see increasing diversity, partly because we've had very high inward migration and in those populations on shore. But like many other countries, um, it's going to reinforce the ageing of the population that, you know, without um, large numbers coming in, between 150 and 200,000 people coming in each year and younger age groups, it's going to emphasise the, the, the um, over 65s. And then I think COVID's going to impact upon fertility. People are not going to have children, certainly not in the short term. So the, these are the questions that we're looking at at the moment. And I've, it sounds as though at times I'm, uh, I know the answers. And, and in fact, we don't, because this is really something that is quite unheralded. So our question, our big overarching question that we're working with internationally and locally is what will mobility and migration look like? Um, inside that is another question that New Zealand has diversified over the last 30 years, and particularly since that 1986-87 change to our migration policy. And it, 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 New Zealand is a very different place um, in 2021. And so what are those super diversity issues for New Zealand? How do we manage uh, encompassing and reflecting and respecting diversity? And in that context, of course, is the question of social cohesion, because in some countries, uh, that diversity has been very divisive, and we've seen politics around the world and in a number of, uh, particularly North um, Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere countries, using uh, diversity, using immigration as a means of restricting people and taking away their rights. So I think there's still a, a, both an international and a domestic question about what does social cohesion look like. Um, thank you. That is the end of my presentation, and I hope I was on time. Yes, uh, perfectly, perfectly on time. There will be time also for questions and answers. Um, suffice it to mention just now that what we all think, I'm sure that uh, New Zealand has been an example, a rare example of um, a government that has seemed to, to manage the situation better than most. And uh, it's very interesting to, to look at, at these issues uh, that, that will have certainly an impact. Um, but before that, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Spundi. And now it is my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Alethia Fernandez de la Reguera, uh, a dear friend and colleague. Um, uh, she is associate researcher at the Institute of Legal Research at UNAM, 
where she co coordinates the National Lab Laboratory of Diversities. Mostly her research focuses on the study of gender and migration, particularly on bureaucracies, institutional violence, uh, and migration policies. Uh, she's a member of the National System of Researchers and uh, an academic coordinator of the UNAM uh, University of Arizona Binational Consortium on Migration, Human Rights, and Human Security. She coordinates the Erasmus MA program Euroculture at UNAM, and for the last four years, she has been a guest scholar at the Erasmus MA management program, Transnational Migrations, at the University of Lille in France. She obtained her PhD with honors in humanistic studies from Tecnológico de Monterrey. She has an MA in European studies from the University of Amsterdam and a BA in international relations from the Tecnológico de Monterrey. She collaborates with a university seminar on internal displacement, migration, exile, and repatriation at UNAM and with a program for the study of Asia and Africa. Uh, she's also part of the UNESCO Tech Chair on Ethics and Peace Studies and a board member of the Institute for Women in Migration based in Mexico City. Aletia, welcome. Uh, we look really forward to uh, listening to your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Annalena Gonzalez, uh, for chairing this panel today. And uh, I also want to thank Professor Alicia Giron and Vania de la Vega for putting this event together. Uh, Professor Giron, she's always thinking about uh, building new spaces for, for reflection, for academic reflection, particularly from an interdisciplinary and, in, and an international perspective. So I am really very glad to be here today. And uh, well, just as my colleague, uh, Dr. Spooley um, started with his presentation, I'm going to share my screen and also before talking about the effects of the COVID-19 in uh, migrants in Mexico, I think it's very important to present the context of uh, immigration policies and patterns in Mexico for our friends and colleagues from New Zealand to uh, understand uh, what are the main effects of COVID-19 in the context of a very complex panorama of migration in Mexico. Uh, my presentation is called uh, Beneficiaries of Humanitarian Aid or Subjects of Human Rights, the Obstacles to Access Social Security for Migrants and Refugees in Mexico within the context of COVID-19. Um, well, uh, the, the, the premise uh, of, of this research is that the pandemic demonstrated the precariousness of international protection mechanisms for migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees provided by the Mexican state. Um, I'm presenting um, part of, of a research that I've been conducting with colleagues from different universities in Latin America. We are seven universities who started a project to follow the effects of the COVID-19 in different migrant communities along the region. Um, and this is a qualitative research. We have been uh, conducting uh, interviews with key actors and our main actors like uh, the organi international organizations, just as the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, the International Organization of Migration, federal government, local agencies, NGOs, um, and also shelters. So our research questions are, how did the pandemic affect the human rights of migrants and refugees in Mexico? And we are particularly focusing on the main obstacles and the challenges of the Mexican state to effectively guarantee access to social protection for migrants, asylum seekers and refugees within the context of COVID-19. Mm. Well, our project, the one that I was talking about with these seven universities is called Caminar. And as I, as I said, it's a very interesting project because we have been conducting the research at the same time with the same instrument to try to understand and uh, conduct a comparative analysis on the effects between different countries. Unfortunately, Mexico is one of the countries who presents uh, bigger obstacles in terms of um, international protection mechanisms uh, for migrants and refugees in the pandemic. Um, and I will explain why. So first, it's important to know that Mexico has recently shifted from being a country of transit and a country of origin. Traditionally, Mexicans have been migrating to the US for more than one century. Uh, and in the last 
20, 30 years, Mexico started to become a very important transit country from uh, different countries, not only in Central America, but also from all around the world that want to enter to the US from Mexico. So we have migrants coming from African countries, we have also people from coming from different uh, parts of Asia. We have people from Sri Lanka, from India, Pakistan. Uh, but what I'm presenting now is basically all that the, the people, that the, the flows that come from Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And Mexico has changed from being a country of transit to become a country of destination. And it's important to say that this is not labor migration, this is forced migration. So um, that's why I'm explaining the difference between being a migrant or being an asylum seeker or being a refugee. What's happening now in Mexico is that people arrived as forced migrants and start their process to become asylum seekers and eventually to become refugees. But this is happening in a context of criminalization of migration. Um, I'm just briefly explaining some, some patterns, some tendencies. Uh, you can see this is that this line is showing this graph is showing Central American transit in, to, through Mexico since 1995 till 2015, and you can see that I mean this is not new. You can see an important peak in 2004, but it's something that started hap to happen in the last 20 years. This uh, uh, Mexico as a territory of transit, and in the end of 2018, we saw a phenomenon that was not new, but it was uh, followed by the media, and it became very important in political terms, especially in the, in the relationship between Mexico and the US, that these were the migrant caravans. Maybe some of you can remember the images that we saw in the media, that we saw thousands and thousands of people coming from different Central American countries arriving to Mexico through this main bridge. This is the, the, the border between Guatemala and Mexico. And these were forcibly, the, the, uh, forcibly um, displaced people who arrived with very particular situations and needs in terms of international protections. Who migrate in a, ca in a caravan? First of all, families, the most vulnerable well, I'm sorry, the most vulnerable people are the ones who migrate in caravan. We can see elderly people. We can see people with uh, particular needs, like we have um, people with disabilities. We have very young families with, with young people, with young babies, with children, women, women that are fleeing from domestic violence. The caravan can a strategy to be visible and to be more protected than when people migrate in smaller groups that they have to go through clandestine channels, clandestine ways to enter Mexico. And especially women and their children are exposed to higher risks. So the caravans is something that we have been studying caravans for the last two years. And some people say, well, this is also part of like a political strategy in terms of um, um, like a social, a social movement of migrants that are actually contesting the system. But also what we're seeing is that this is a strategy that is there for, for the people that have been trying to migrate for, for many months and they don't have the, the capacity to pay for, to a trafficker. And this is the safest way to migrate, even though it sounds that contradictory because of course they are exposed to high risk when they are migrating in these conditions in very poor and harsh conditions. So what was the response of the Mexican government? First of all, it was an unprepared response. More, uh, we, we started to see the, the, the presence of the military uh, guards in the border. We started also to see more temporary detention centers all around the border. And at the same time, we started to see this contradiction between the enforcement of militarization and criminalization and the need of having more people uh, as asylum seekers in Mexico. Because as I said, this is not an economic migration. This is people that have been forced, forced to, to, to leave their homes and they need international protection in Mexico. What you're seeing here is the blue line exposes the, the, the number of um, applications the asylum applications that have been accepted by the Mexican government. And the orange line shows the number of applications that the government has received. 
what are we seeing here? We see that there is this important gap between the number of re applications that are received and the ones that are resolved. There is an important delay in the processes. Why? Because the Mexican government was not prepared institutionally, even though we have the law for refugees, we were not prepared institutionally to have this big number of people asking for refugee. This is just to show that the, the main caravans at the end of 2018 and 2019 also tried to go to the north. They tried to get to the U.S. And in the U.S. they found this uh, Exter is this program that is called the Mexican Migration Protocol that is an externalization of border control uh, strategy from the government of Trump. And with this program, what, they, what the U.S. government imposed to the Mexican government was that asylum seekers had to wait in the Mexican side of the border, asylum seekers in the U.S. So what happened with this program? 70,000 people participated in the program, only 2.6% received an affirmative response, more than 50% received a removal order, and they have been waiting for months in the Mexican side of the border with the US. So uh, this is something that has been uh, a, a very, very, very hard situation for all that in the international organizations, for the shelters, for all the NGOs, that were providing services because can you can imagine that the cities of the Mexican uh, border were not um, prepared to receive such uh, big groups and in such uh, very hard conditions. What happened? The COVID pandemic arrived within this very difficult scenario. In the south of the country, you have the detention centers, you have the military guards that are prohibiting new caravans to arrive. And in the northern border of Mexico with the US, you had also a closed border with the US government, not only um, limiting the human right to ask for asylum in the US, but also with the COVID pandemic, what the US government did was to have a, a immediate deportations and immediate returns from the US, not only from Mexican immigrants in the, in the US, but also Central Americans. So you had a lot of, pro we had a lot of problems at the beginning of the, of the pandemic in both borders, because of course the, 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 the government offices were not prepared also to respond to the uh, uh, healthy and sanitary emergency that we had with the COVID. And with the big numbers that I show you of, of the asylum seekers that already presented their application and that time they had to wait, you can imagine that with a pandemic, the first problem that we had is that these procedures extended in, in a long period. We have people that have been waiting for a response from, from, the, U, from the Mexican government for more than 10 months or one year. So the, one of the main uh, effects was that withdrawal of procedures. Many people stopped their procedure of asylum seeking. Why? Because also they, they first they need to work they need to find a way to survive. And the Mexican law on refugee requires that the same place where you started your procedure is a place where you need to wait the whole process. So if you started your procedure in the southern border of Mexico, you need to wait until the end of the process. And you can imagine this is a big problem because 60% of the, the applications are received in the, in the southern states of Mexico, Chiapas, eh, Veracruz, uh, Tabasco, which are the states that are the poorest states and with the less possibility of offering uh, employment and, and good conditions for living while people are waiting for the procedures. So what we're seeing with the COVID pandemic is that uh, even though we have two good laws in terms of the migration law and the refugee law actually have like a human rights uh, approach, well, there are big contradictions with the legal frameworks and a lot of ambiguity. So in real terms, in practice, even though we have these laws, in practice, people have very limited possibilities to access health and education services. Even though the law states that services as uh, for health and education are open to all migrants, regardless of their immigration status, what we have been seeing is first, just as we talked at the beginning of last presentation, there is um, this uh, discourse of xenophobia, uh, long waiting periods, 
uh, for people that have been waiting, even though before the pandemic, well, now they don't have possibility to start an integration process because they don't have a legal status in that country, limited freedom of movement. And the obstacles to access health services are not particularly a problem for migrants. This is a problem that has been along the whole country, also for Mexicans. But when an immigrant arrives, and particularly an immigrant that doesn't speak Spanish and that clearly is not uh, uh, from the region, there is also a lot of xenophobic responses, not only from the population, but from even the, 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 the health practitioners. A lot of informality within the jobs. So this actually has specific uh, effects on housing, for example, because people are not being able to pay their rents. So the shelters in both parts of the, uh, well, in the whole country, but particularly in the north and the southern borders, have been working in an emergency and, and within a crisis for the last year, because we have shelters that didn't have the possibility to keep working with a pandemic. We also had shelters that had to be completely uh, re refurbished to have people living in the pandemic in the situation with a, with good uh, health and sanitary uh, conditions. So everything started to become a problem like in a chain. First, the impossibility to have uh, the, the asylum uh, pr process like working. Then we have the problem of informality, the problem of people not having able to have uh, an income. And there is uh, the, uh, then the situation of housing and, of course, as I said, difficulties for health services and education. And I'm already uh, finishing, uh, but I just want to say that what the pandemic proved in Mexico is a precariousness of international protection mechanisms because the few mechanisms that we have before the pandemic were temporal. We had this temporal visa so people in caravans could go to the north trying to get to the US. And this proved to be insufficient in a crisis just like the pandemic. And also a very important issue that we need to discuss further is the role of civil society and international organizations. Uh, they have been a key actor leading the main responses to provide safe housing, access to health services and food to migrants. So this makes us think about the, 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 the policies that the Mexican government is not only not implementing, but is like talking about a policy of indifference. The policy of indifference in terms of providing social security to these populations, uh, the, the clear effect is that there are other actors that are taking the place of the government, in this case, as I said, that United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the or International Organization of Migrations, together with NGOs, that are the ones who are actually uh, trying to guarantee the access of the main human right that is first to ask for asylum the country and then to be able to uh, wait for this process uh, within a, a safe place to be within a good job and a possibility to be free of, of violence. And this is of course not being provided by the Mexican state. Um, so just to finish my, my the conclusion is that uh, human rights are conditioned by the immigration status in Mexico. And this has been uh, particularly uh, obvious with uh, the pandemic because uh, even though people are in the country, no, they, they, are, they, they don't have access to the main services, just as I said, health services and education. And also that integration processes are being uh, not only stopped, but it's like there was, is that they are, com we, we're taking steps back with integration processes of populations that were already started to, to be integrated in the country. And there is like this setback of, of the integration processes for refugees. And in the case of migrants and asylum seekers, they are becoming or they have become beneficiaries of temporal humanitarian aid exposed to insecurity and to human rights violations. And I, I hope to be able to further discuss this in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alethia. What, what a, a striking contrast between, between the two presentations. Um, and I am intrigued um, about the numbers, you know, um, the number of people uh, circulating in one region and another. I'm sure the, the fact that uh, 
uh, New Zealand is an archipelago may have a lot to do with with uh, the way in which migration functions over there. And, and yet um, th there is a lot more than one would have imagined. And um, the transformation that has been uh, occurring in Mexico in the last couple of decades, and mo most recently with the advent of, of the caravan way of, of uh, migrating, represent so many so many problems, uh, so many challenges to to any any political system. Um, there are a few questions that have been posted, and uh, perhaps Professor. Uh, Spoonly, you would would you like to to comment on the first question that that was uh, posted about the the inversion of the population pyramid in New Zealand? Yes, thank you, Elena. Um, New Zealand government policy is deeply frustrating, and it's deeply frustrating because we know what the demographic structure and drivers are, and we know what it's going to be like in 2030 or 2040. But the government is using um, migration as a short-term economic incentive. So it accepts that um, migrants add to the, the schools, the talent pool to add to, they bring you businesses, uh, they add to innovation. There's good research for all of that. But of course, um, what COVID has done is really query the long-term viability when you've got an aging population on one side and a declining fertility on another, so we're well below sub-replacement fertility at the moment, and you're using immigration not only to add to the economic activities of the country, but it's actually acting as a very important supplement to population. So what COVID-19, I think, has done is, is, is expose the inversion of the population without that middle bit being added to by uh, having large numbers of migrants arrive. The, the other question, if I could answer that quickly, is that is, is, the, is Chinese migration likely to slow? Um, we've got the Chinese in New Zealand are very transnational. Um, they're not unlike some of the Central and South American communities that you find in the US who maintain incredibly strong cross-border linkages. Um, in terms of business, families, communities, culture, religion, and so on. And the Chinese do that here. So we've got very, very wealthy Chinese because of our pick and choose system who still have their business or their home in Shanghai. Excuse me. Shanghai. And who will continue to um, move across the borders. And at the moment, of course, they're much preferring New Zealand uh, for, for a, a variety of reasons. But I think the other thing which I think we need to factor in <coughs> for those countries like New Zealand who see China as a major source of migrants is that the Chinese government have moved very quickly from having a demographic dividend to a demographic deficit. And, and I don't think in the next five or ten years the Chinese government are going to allow its best and brightest to migrate to a country like New Zealand. So I think the incentives to come to New Zealand will still be there. New Zealand will still want Chinese migrants, but I think there's a big question mark about whether the Chinese government will allow international students or wealthy migrants or well or skilled people to migrate to other countries in the future because they can't afford to, to lose that skill. Um, very well. Um, Alepia, um, would you like to, to address the question uh, that Alicia is posing about the report of the um, International Monetary Fund? Yes, uh, and also after that, I would like to pose some questions to, to Professor Paul. Um, yes, um, maybe I, I, I should have explained better the, the pushing conditions or the expelling conditions of migrants from Central America. And uh, there are, first of all, the um, harsh economic conditions, but the main situation, and is, uh, of course, there is a big critic of the, 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 the what uh, Professor uh, Hiron is saying, that the policies that the Central American uh, have been, the policies that Central American countries 
have to, to accept after the, the Kafka agreement, that is the Central American Free Trade Agreement. The main problem is that there is this uh, organized, uh, crimin, uh, organized crime along the countries and the, the situation that is that there is like the structural violence that is caused by poverty, by uh, very difficult uh, um, situation, not only in terms of, of employment, but also in terms of the, uh, insti the, the relationship between the, the state and the government institutions and the population. Because there is also the structural violence and the community violence that is part of everyday lives. Uh, and is part of, of the, la, the different uh, pandillas, the, the, the organized crime that is in, in all these communities. And when people try to uh, approach the authorities, well, usually there is a lot of collusion between the authorities and the organized crime. So, all, and also there is a, the climate change situation. We have seen it in the last months when uh, with the rains, with the, diffi uh, the difficulties that Honduras uh, have with, with a, this situation of having a big and strong uh, rainy season. And then people in new caravans arrive just after some weeks of this disaster, this uh, natural disaster. So we have the three causes, I would say economic causes, criminal and uh, structural violence, and also the, the natural disasters. Those are like the main causes of Central American uh, crisis coming through caravans and without caravans for the last 10 years. Alethea, can I, can I just add to that? Because one of the things we've been looking at in New Zealand, and it's a very different situation from Mexico, is that if you, if you close down opportunities for migrants or refugees, then one of the few alternatives they have is then to turn to illicit um, um, systems and organisations. So what we've been anticipating, and I think you're probably much closer to the action in Mexico than we are, is that even in a country like New Zealand, we will see informal and irregular and criminal activity increase as a result of what's happened with COVID. What we're seeing here is that with the COVID-19, Mexico didn't close its borders. The border with the U.S. was partially closed and the border, it just was uh, open due to um, uh, essential activities. But the Central American governments, they closed their borders. And what we saw is the same thing that we see when there is criminal, more criminalization and detention in the borders, that as you say, uh, re uh, asylum seekers and migrants start using like uh, more clandestine routes to arrive to the country. So this is something that it has been proven with more militarization, with more criminalization. And I would say that now the risk is that we know that people at, at the end, they are going to arrive, even if they have to go through very difficult situations, if they have to pay to a trafficker because they are fleeing from death. That's what's, that's why they say when we have these interviews and this uh, opportunity to talk to, to asylum seekers, they say, I cannot come back. But the problem now is that there's a lot of xenophobia and hate discourse in Mexico that they believe that many of the asylum seekers or the displaced people, the migrants, they also are part of criminal act they they are part of criminal groups from their origin countries of origin and of course we know that sometimes in a big caravan there are good people and bad people coming in the caravan but the big numbers are good people and the problem is that we have this discourse that we're thinking all central americans are part of the mara or are part of a pandilla and and i think we need to be careful with that but as you say more criminalization, the result is higher risks and more vulnerability for these groups. And, and well, Dr. Spoon, I have two questions for you. I don't know if I have the chance now to, to pose the questions. Um, I really, uh, I, 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 there are many things that I would like to learn more about the New Zealand model. First, I want to ask you, what's the criteria for a temporal mig migration? What's the criteria to, for establishing that one person is a temporal migrant? Um, also, I'm, I don't know if 
there that the temporal migrants are increasing in New Zealand or not. And in case they are increasing, I don't know what's the relationship between this increment and the soft citizenship model. I think it's very interesting, the soft citizenship model that you explained and the super uh, diversity model. And, and another third question that is very different from this, I would like to understand what's the relationship between New Zealand and Australia in terms of you have to come, I know everybody poses this question, but for me, it's something that it really intrigues me, two completely different and contradictory models. You have Australia with this offshore detention uh, infrastructure, and you have New Zealand with the soft citizenship and the super diversity. What is the relationship or how is the relationship between those con these two countries? in this topic, because naturally, I believe that you are affected by the Australian model. But that's that was my question. Yeah. Thank we, you. We're, we're rather like you in Mexico, with a big, big brother just north of our border. And in this case, our, our, the, board, the, the big brother is Australia, and relations are not good. So in the last week, um, it's quite a complicated story, but it started uh, just after 2000, when the um, New Zealanders in Australia were being problematised. And the, the feeling is and remains is that they were problematised because quite a number of them were Māori and Pacifica, so they were um, there was an element of racism there. And then what the Australian government have been doing recently is um, deporting people back to New Zealand, 2,000 of them, um, so on, on quite often um, quite flimsy grounds. So there's there's a number of them have been deported to New Zealand when they've never lived in New Zealand. They might have a New Zealand passport, which they can do, uh, but they've never lived in New Zealand. So I, in a word, the, the relationship between Australia and New Zealand is, is very um, uh, problematic at the moment. And we have very, very different approaches to issues of racism, uh, migration, refugees, offshoring. So we've offered to take um, the refugees from those offshore camps, but the Australian government refuses to. And the reason they refuse it is that they would uh, then, those people would then get a New Zealand passport and be able to enter Australia, and that's what they don't want. Um, the temporary migrants, New Zealand has moved to a system where temporary migrants actually provide an onshore pool. So almost two thirds of the people who are given permanent residence have already been in New Zealand on a temporary basis. So if you come here as an international student, you can study for three years and then you can get a transition visa, which gives you two years to find a job. And if you get that job, then you can actually transition and become a permanent resident. So when you look at our um, international students, about one in five of them actually becomes a permanent student, a permanent resident of New Zealand. So we've been using that temporary uh, work scheme. And then there are a range of visa um, conditions. So we have, um, your Mexican ambassador in New Zealand is a bit upset with us because we give very generous um, temporary visa um, um, uh, uh, conditions and numbers to a, a range of South American countries like Argentina and Brazil, um, and he's wanting the, uh, more for, for Mexicans. Um, so we have these arrangements with countries in your region in which you're allowed to come here on what's called a holiday working visa. And so you can work and you can work out for up to a year. And I would point out um, that we have a Mexican-born member of our parliament. Um, so the Mexican um, temporary migrant population is actually quite a significant one in New Zealand, even though the Mexican ambassador would like to see more Mexicans given the opportunity to come to New Zealand on that temporary basis. And then they become permanent or they can become permanent residents. Thank you. So now we know we have more things in common with these big brothers. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of we have a lot of problems in common with our big brothers, indeed. Thank you. There is another question um, regarding the the, the very difficult uh, problem or challenge of integrating people with entirely different cultural views and values. Uh, women's rights are mentioned, for example. Um, what would the question is for both of you? So, if if, if each could address it uh, as well. Alicia, you go first. 
Well, I must say, um, in the case of Mexico, first of all, that we need always to think about the real numbers of refugees in Mexico. The, the highest number that we had was in 2019. We, we closed that year with 70,000 uh, asylum seekers in Mexico. So in a country of more than 120 million, 70,000 is not that much. First, it's important just to say that we are eventually becoming a country of destination, but we need to learn a lot from integration policies and from multiculturality. But we had a very interesting um, uh, example that are the uh, people from Haiti who arrived in 2015, 2017, and now are very well integrated in the city of Tijuana, in the northern border of Mexico. So there you have a, a clear case of people who arrive without speaking Spanish. They come from a different culture, and they the, the, the effects have been actually very positive. And when if you are in Tijuana and you talk to, to local people, they have a very good perception of people from Haiti. And at the beginning, they were very uh, negative. They, they rejected them. But after some time, they started to see that they were gaining more with this new population, that they were trying to get a new life. They are hardworking people and they speak and they learn very well Spanish. And now they are part of that community. So I think that in the case of Mexico, what we need is to be able to have more experiences because we feel we are very open and we are uh, very, there is a lot of hospitality from the Mexican community. But in reality, I think we are very racist and we need to learn more about multiculturalism policies. I'll answer as quickly as I can. Uh, just, just to reinforce, we get about 150,000 permanent uh, residents arriving each year. We get about 300,000 temporary residents arriving each year. That doesn't include people like tourists. Um, and then we get about 1,500 refugees. So our refugee uh, population is very, very small. Um, the, the two things that help those migrants settle easiest are learning English. And as Leonel um, and Selena will know, um, learning English in New Zealand, it, we're not talking English, we're talking New Zealand English, so it's a, it's a particular form of English, as you can hear from my, from my voice. Uh, but, but allowing them to interact and have that language facility is critically important. And the second is getting work experience. So that helps. The third thing I would say is that um, I'm currently working on, I, I wrote a cabinet paper quite some years ago on social cohesion, which was completely ignored. It was invited, our cabinet, our Cabinet invited it and I wrote it, and, and it's being rewritten at the moment uh, because of a Royal Commission uh, recommendation. But the thing that I think is important is what can you do to help settle new, new rivals into the country? But the equally important question is what do you do to help the host communities adjust and respect and interact with those new communities? I, I think it's a complete. Um, a complete um, misappropriation or a, 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 to focus simply on the migrants and how to help them settle when you don't help the communities that are already in New Zealand adjust to and uh, accept those uh, new arrivals. And I think that our schools do an excellent job, I must say, but I think it's right from that community level all the way through to national institutions like our education system, all the way through to the voices at the top. And I do think policies and voices matter. You know, what I've noticed over the last um, decade is the way in which some politicians, nationalist and populist politicians and countries, uh, problematize, stigmatize, demonize people who are different. And as Alethea was saying that, you know, in the caravans, you've got they are mostly good people with a small group of bad people. You don't demonise the good people. You deal with the bad people, but you also deal with the the media and the people who would uh, who would demonise everybody from a particular community, a particular caravan. And so I think that dealing with the domestic politics and domestic views is as important as anything. 
Very well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. It's been fascinating and I'm sure that uh, it has um, uh, provoked many, many thoughts uh, on this uh, fascinating and uh, really difficult topic. Um, thank you to everybody who has been following us on, on the internet and uh, do stay for, for what follows uh, when, in, within the, the symposium. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, Annalena and Aletia and Paul. Very good session. <laughs>